Hello, um, my name is Henriette Road Cunliffe, and I am very honoured and very happy to present this keynote at uh, this Sharing is Caring anniversary. I am an Associate Professor in Digital Humanities at the University of Copenhagen, and I recently published a book on open heritage data that in part is the foundation of my talk today. Introducing open data in the GLAM sector means that the mediation of heritage is not the sole privilege of these institutions anymore. In theory, anyone, anywhere can use heritage material that is fully open for any purpose. However, in practice, this has not happened to the degree that many in the open glam community had hoped and that others had perhaps feared. While researching for my book, the use of years of digitization and online publication with various degrees of openness, I've discovered a lot to celebrate, as well as issues that continue to stand in the way of incorporating open glam in education, in creativity, and in research. Today I want to share with you first a celebration of the journey that we as a community have taken towards openness. And then, as with any good critique sandwich, I will add some filling in the form of a discussion of two important issues that I believe we need to tackle going forward. And finally, I'll introduce you to some of the continued research uh, that I'm doing in order to discover a broader understanding of these issues, as well as a path towards solutions. In my book, I introduce openness as a journey the GLAM institutions have taken throughout their history. Before we had the institutions themselves, we had amateurs, in the sense that they were self-funded and didn't have formal training in the field. And these amateurs collected, curated, and sometimes published about heritage. This early heritage work was shared through family and other close ties. And in order to take part, you had to have your own means of funding. Later, this evolved into the institutions that we know today. We have a certain sense of when these institutions began, but this is solely based on our knowledge of institutionalization in richer parts of the world. And even here, we sometimes see that part of our heritage is still only shared through amateur networks, particularly if it's not deemed to reflect dominant culture or thoughts. However, with these institutions come funding and an increased education of a professional sphere of heritage workers who could technically come from any lay of society. These institutions also open up some of their collections physically for the public to see. Here we have to keep in mind, though, uh, that physical access still provides some barriers. The main one being that curation and access is often limited to mainstream narratives. Most institutions have a lot more material than they could ever give public access to physically. Also, even to visit the institution, to see what is readily available is not an option for everyone. The web has given us amazing possibilities to open up access potentially to anyone with an internet connection, which again we often forget not everyone has. But too often it's been in the form of a look but don't touch digital publication. So again it's a huge step in openness but it still leaves us with many obstacles. This is where open data and the idea of open glam comes in. This makes heritage and cultural material available in such a way that anyone with a stable internet connection can access, use and repurpose our common heritage in its different formats for the purposes that they choose. Be it for family history, for creative face masks or for a gaming app that they can earn money of. This is, the, this is currently the frontier of openness. And over the last 10 years, we've seen more and more institutions that have joined this path. However, despite these great optics, there are still varying degrees of openness out there. In the book, I set about to create a model that can be used to evaluate this degree of openness. 
And I want to introduce this model to you with examples of various institutions and how they're tackling these elements. The model contains five levels or questions, if you will. And the first asks if the material is published online with metadata so that it can be searched and filtered. Metadata, for those who are not aware, is the data about data. So information such as title, creator, date, and more. The Arab Image Foundation in Lebanon is an example of this, where the site displays uh, Middle Eastern heritage photographs together with metadata such as uh, photographer, uh, dates, subjects, uh, and more that can, that can be searched. The second question asks whether the material is published with an open license or in the public domain, and whether this is clearly communicated in conjunction with the material. Wien Museum in Austria is a new example of this. They've recently made over 50,000 images and items available in their collections portal, most of them as open content. It is very clear in their interface how to filter for this open content. And when you navigate to the individual items, the license or copyright information is clearly indicated. The third question asks whether the institution actively encourages reuse of the material and provides support for anyone who wishes to use it free of charge. Lake Studio at the Rijksmuseum in the Netherlands is a great example of an, an institution encouraging reuse. For each artwork, uh, this is clear with buttons like download this uh, work and get creative or order this work as a poster or a canvas. On top of this, they occasionally host the Rijks Studio Awards, which is a design competition where they invite everyone to create their own masterpiece inspired by the Rijks Museum collection. The fourth question asks whether material is available in an open machine readable format that anyone can download. To exemplify this, I'll go back to an archaeological favour of mine, the Portable Antiquity Scheme in England and Wales. The site enables and encourages the recording of archaeological objects found by members of the public and today contains information about uh, one and a half million objects. Many of these are found through metal detecting work and uh, field walking. The site allows users to download records individually or in bulk, as well as uh, encouraging and promoting research using the scheme's data set. So far, a total of 779 projects are registered with the site, ranging from personal projects uh, through student projects to major research projects. Finally, the last question asks if the material is available through a well-described API that anyone has access to. API or application programming interface is a technology where you through the web can send a request straight to a database, for example, as a URL, and receive up to date versions of the request in a in data format that you can use for programming or for data science. I want to exemplify this with the Trove site hosted by the National Library of Australia, where you can explore collections from Australian GLAM institutions and universities. Trove has an API which is well documented and available for registered users. And previous Trove manager Tim Shirt has done a lot of work on tutorials that show how to engage with this API, which is also a, a great starting point for heritage data science, something that I've also been testing with my own stu uh, students in the humanities faculty. So this is the journey so far. Douglas McCarthy and Dr. Andrea Wallace have compiled a list of nearly a thousand GLAM institutions across approximately 50 countries, making open data available in various ways. This is indeed something to celebrate. But now for the more critical filling of my sandwich. While we should celebrate the journey so far, 
We must also remember that three quarters of the world's countries are not represented on the list. And in the countries that are on the list, there are many, many institutions that are also not a part of this journey. Often it is only larger national institutions that are. There are still many hurdles that stand in the way of open data in the GLAM sector. Among them are the obvious issues of copyright, data protection, and the potential loss of revenue. Others are more vague, uh, such as just not seeing the need for open data or digital access. For example, the belief that physical access meets most needs and that only local people have an interest in your collection. Also the fear of misuse or just an alternative use that doesn't fit mainstream history or the institution's chosen narrative is a theme. However, today I want to focus on two issues that I believe we desperately need to tackle in future. The first is fear. One thing I often encounter is the fear of legal difficulties, which I found to be more of a deterrent than the actual uh, leg legislation itself. Many are afraid of getting it wrong and of the consequences that could follow from this. And this fear leaks through to the potential users and has uh, many repercussions for uh, creativity and innovation. The fear often stems from lack of knowledge and experience, as well as a lack of policy and support from above. And when I say from above, I mean in different contexts. Within the individual organization, this could be a lack of support from management. And within a wider context, this could be a lack of uh, guidelines or policy from government and, and uh, from government agencies and politicians. And this leads to fear and uncertainty about how to practice open data uh, across the whole sector. Uh, the other issue I want to discuss is a desperate lack of active users for these digital tools and open collections. I would, for example, argue that open data projects won't survive without an active user base. I predict that it will be more and more difficult to motivate funding for projects that do not have this user base. And the projects that are already funded will not be maintained when the initial funding runs out. In the digital humanities, the sure and certain death of digital projects is a well-known problem. And I would argue that it is a natural consequence of projects which have never been developed for well-known and active uh, user groups, or perhaps in the worst case, have been developed for a small group of researchers who probably could have done the work in a cloud-based system. Now, this may sound a little bit harsh, and therefore I want to um, exemplify it with some of my own sometimes failed projects. So eight years ago, I developed a few online tools and collections, uh, two of which I would like to compare here today. The first was a tool for the knitting community, and the second was a tool for researchers reading ancient documents. The first tool, uh, the, the knitting tool, works just as well today as when I uh, first developed it. Sure, there have been issues along the way that I've had to fix, but at least I knew exactly when the issues occurred and I was strongly motivated to fix them because there was this constant group of knitters using the tool who would contact me at once when they experienced problems with it. This was not my experience with the other tool which gave access to transcriptions uh, of the Vindalanda tablets from Hadrian's Wall in the UK. I developed this as a part of my PhD with some quite nifty search options, if I say so myself. And uh, in the 10 years that passed, I've only had one email about it. At that point, it wasn't really working anymore. And I have very little motivation to fix it, even if I could access it again. This is simply because it wasn't built to be actively used uh, by a clear group of people. And this is not because there aren't users out there who actively seek heritage data, because there is. At the moment, a couple of colleagues and I are studying 
Danish family historians and their online behaviour. They use a variety of different tools and collections, most of which are not built by glam institutions. Instead, they're built by family historians wanting to help each other and themselves, as well as private companies looking uh, to profit from this enormous interest in and use of heritage data. So far, I and others have, have focused greatly on understanding what institutions do and how they do it, what they publish online and how they go about it. But again, if we look around us in the heritage community, there are still very few institutions who are actively engaging in open data, who are trying to open their collections to use and reuse online. They are so few that we still meet them with a social media fanfare each time a new resource announces its arrival in the open glam community. Above, I describe some of the issues that we face with open data. And based on that, I argued that the biggest issue is still that we're not quite sure what this open data can be used for and how we engage with and encourage people who might want to use it. This is why my research going forward will focus more on understanding the potential active use of open glam collections. On the one hand, I'm using a practice based autoethnographic study, putting myself in the user's place and experiencing first and foremost how it is to use uh, open data uh, from glam institutions. How easy is it to get started? What are the tripping points? What makes me hesitant? And fearful. The idea here is to explore these different issues by taking active part in these communities. For many collections, use is still so limited that a more exploratory research is a necessary starting point. However, simultaneous steps include studying a larger community of people who are using heritage data online. For example, through the project Family History Online, which I mentioned earlier. Perhaps through them we can learn how to create sustainable and actively useful open glam collections. For this practice-based autoethnographic study, I've thrown myself onto two different types of research of glam collections. The first is something that I have been uh, doing and teaching for years, namely testing and showcasing how and what can be done with the most open collections according to the model I discussed earlier. I simply test and create tutorials showing how to use uh, GLAM APIs on my blog. The example here shows a few visualizations and initial analysis of 19th century Danish dog protocols with the most popular dog names, uh, breeds and colors. While testing and explaining my process in a tutorial aimed at people in the heritage sector with fewer technical skills, I have a few preliminary thoughts. The first is that there is a huge gap in the market for real beginners introductions to data science and programming for adults. Beginners material uh, aimed at adults usually presume that these adults already have uh, a technical understanding. So it's not really beginners material at all. The only true beginners material that is available uh, seems to be the, the things that are aimed at children. Um, this includes information on how to find a platform or environment to, to work in, uh, how to get started with programming, for example, with very simple steps. The second thing is that uh, open GLAM APIs are not in general well documented. If there is documentation at all, you often need a substantial technical background to understand it. I think this is very much a consequence uh, of what I was talking about earlier, this lack of users and, and lack of actual use. The other type of reuse of open glam that I am, I'm trying to practice uh, is found in the creative sphere. Imagine if more people could use glam material creatively while interpreting our culture or simply learning from the past in the way that the Rijksmuseum is encouraging. I'm trying this by using collections with openly licensed or public domain images 
to create new artwork that I can get printed on fabric, wallpaper, cups and much more. This is again also a work in progress but I have some preliminary thoughts here too. The first is that many online collections are very difficult to search either because images are not tagged for creative findability or because there's too much other material in the portal which is not relevant for this type of use. Secondly, in the creative community, licensing and copyright is scary stuff. Uh, many people are up in arms because they daily experience or hear about someone whose designs have been stolen. At the same time, there's a lot of focus on original designs and we also have commercial companies and even glam institutions who give off the idea that they own copyright uh, of heritage images or material when, when it's actually unclear whether they do. And all of this of course occurs online where there are a lot of different opinions and tensions often rise very quickly. All in all it is very it's very scared, uh, very easy to get scared in this environment. And fear is a definite killer of innovation and creativity. Uh, for my own part, not a week seems to go by where I don't want to throw in the towel and say I'll never uh, do any creative reuse again. Um, and in this atmosphere, it doesn't help that the institutions holding these collections are also afraid. Instead, they need to communicate clearly that they encourage and value creative reuse of their collections, also for commercial purposes. So this was a short introduction to how I'm going forward in my research on open data and GLAM. I hope that we can uh, continue to both celebrate the journey uh, that, that we've taken so far, but also continue an open and critical discussion of how we can include more glam institutions, more active users, uh, more diverse narratives, as well as tackle uh, the fear going forward uh, in open glam. Thank you.